the three uh, the three sisters I was telling you mentioning in prayer uh, all three of them got at least A's and B's this time and and one one girl and, and this was their third year and one girl I think she was sent the time out half the time the first year got straight A's and I'm telling you I'm just astounded and they're going to Callum yes those three girls are going to Callum and, and young Nathan remember Nathan that was baptized before the pandemic those four from Star are going to Callum and uh, yeah it is it's real awesome <laughs> so um, and I wanted to mention uh Winston, uh, the, the memorial service is at Judson Baptist uh, in Taze Valley, Saturday at 2, the memorial service for his sister, just, just so you're aware of that. All right. What does Jesus have to say about people we don't like? Um, we looked at a couple of passages last week. We're going to look at a couple more this week and basically last week in in the in the uh when we when we looked at my help if i get back over to where i need to be we looked at matthew 5 21 through 26 but especially 21 through 24 and and really found ourselves challenged to deal with our anger not let it get out of hand and out of control and make things right with the other person. Don't let it build up. We also uh, looked at uh, Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42, and, and the whole idea of non-retaliation, which is absolutely not innately in us, right? The whole idea of uh, don't strike back, stop the downward spiral, be the bridge builder. Um, and, we, and we finished last week by looking at how Jesus didn't just teach that philosophical thought, that, that doctrine of the faith. He lived it. He lived it to the point of giving his very life. Um, so it doesn't get any easier because we're going to pick up right after that in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. And uh, for those of you who are studying with us at home, we've got Nick monitoring the, the computer. And if you have any comments or questions, don't hesitate to, to, to send them to FBCSA attendees. And, and uh, Nick will bring them up. Yeah, we could put it on the screen, but then you couldn't see it because I'm standing right in front of it. And I'm not going to stand over there. <laughs> Plus, we can monitor it. <laughs> I kind of like that. Uh, okay, let, let's look at verses 43 through 48. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son, S-U-N, to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You hear that last statement and you're thinking, well, it's easy for Jesus to say, <laughs> right? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So you've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Where is that in Scripture? Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. You're, you're thinking Leviticus? Well, the, the truth is you're not going to find that statement in Scripture. That's a rabbinical twisting of the word. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's, you'll find that. But nowhere does it say hate your enemy. But the rabbinical teaching the, in, in the tradition of the elders and, and, uh, and their explanation of Old Testament teachings and laws, that became a very common thought. 
that we kind of came up. That, that's what the, the basic line of thinking was. And Jesus addresses that head on, and he says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, you know, I, I think about this, and I think it's very easy to read these words and just kind of think, that is so noble. That is righteous thinking. That is, that is certainly the teaching of our Lord. And there's no way in the world I can do that. And I'm just going to move on down the road. And just, let's, let's see what he says next. But we can't, can we? I mean, that's really, this is Jesus teaching. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. You know, those words remind me of a couple of Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Doesn't that sound like love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven? So what does Jesus have to say about people we don't like? Right here, he says, love them and pray for them. Love them and pray for them. We're not going to make this more complicated than it is. Love them and pray for them. So let's start with the idea of how do you love people you don't like? Uh, and I, and this, this isn't sentimentality. This is this is, this is biblical love that shows itself in action, okay? So how, how, how do you even start loving people you don't like? Or, I can see where you could pray for them. Yes. But, and maybe pray that you are shown how to love. There you go. Where are you going to start? If you, if, if somebody's your enemy or you, you don't like them or there's just a wall between the two of you, where do you start? You start by getting coming clean with God, right? You, you open up. You say, God, it is not here. It's not in me right now. I need you to show me how. I need you to show me how to love that person. Um, let me, I think as we do that, this is what I think he will do. And I will probably put this on the back of the prayer sheet next week. I didn't want to put it on there this week because I really want us to think about it. If we are honest, like Tom suggested, and just say, God, I, it is not in me to do this. I need your help. He's going to help us see the people we don't like through his eyes. Now, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Because that automatically expands our perspective. Because what do we see in somebody we don't like? We see the negative. We see all the things they do that drive us crazy. We think about the things they've done to hurt us. That's what we focus on. That's what we think of. We're asking him to show us how to love this person. So he's going he's gonna to start by helping us begin to see that person through his eyes. And one of the things that I think one of the ways that happens is it, it helps us try to take a couple of steps back and become objective. And in the sense that everybody has a story, right? You have a story and I have a story. You and I are where we are because of our life experiences, the decisions we've made as we've gone throughout life, the things that we experienced as we were as we were growing up, the things we experienced in relationships to others. Um, every one of us has a story, and every one of us can look, anybody we're dealing with, we can look at, and we can see reasons why they get where they are or how they got where they are. And that creates some empathy, typically. Hopefully. So I think, I think, you know, 
if we're honest with God, and he's going to enable us to begin to see that person through his eyes, from his perspective. I think also he's going to help us look for good in them, to be intentional about that. I mean, you've got to find places to build on, right, in a, in a relationship that's broken, in a relationship that's where there's been pain, to, to, to look for the good in them. And, and that's going to be something that God will use in your relationship with that person at the right time. When you recognize, you know, they may, maybe they treat everybody like dirt except their family. For, I'm just saying for example. Well, that's something good about them. How they love and care for their family. Even though they make everybody around them matter and wet hornets, Right? But, but you see something good. And you can build, you can use that as, as time goes along. Something that I found really helpful, and, and you can pray, you, you pray about it, is to ask God to help you find a specific need they have. Something that you might be able to step in and, and assist them with. Um, that's, that's been very, very helpful as, through the years. Something God enables us to do is to offer kind words. You know, what, what did we say last, last week? We were looking at Proverbs. A gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anger, right? You know, you, can, you know card, kind words can go through handwritten notes. Or cards. How many of us don't? I mean, we love to get cards with handwritten notes in them, don't we? Because people don't do that much anymore. It's emailing and texting and, and all that. And I'm not saying, you know, you can, I've used all that. You know, you can use whatever is, is prayerfully most effective to reach somebody. But, you know, handwritten notes are nice ways to, to, to open doors and plant seeds and, and, and in terms of trying to build a relationship or stop it from spiraling down. You know, maybe, maybe it's a relationship that, that was good for years and then boom, all of a sudden something happened and it went sour. Well, all of these things can be ways to reach out. And, and to try to build that relationship back. Um, okay, we're, we're confessing our need. We're asking God to help us. I think if we confess our hardness of heart, if we confess our poor attitudes, ask God to change what we need to change in us. There's very few of us in any relationship that is bad. You know, whether it's somebody we're, we're just at odds with or somebody that's hurt us, there's very few of us that don't need some attitude adjustment along the way. Um, that's, and that, that's gutsy, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're asking God to show you. You're upset with this person. You don't like this person, but you're asking God to show you what kind of attitude adjustment you need to make. I need to make. Any reaction to that or thought about that? I mean, how feasible is what we're talking about here? Do you it's think hard to be planned. An effort will gain us any points? With the Lord? <laughs> well, uh, I think... I think God appreciates people who take their faith seriously enough that in, in, in strained relationships they're willing to be open to do what's necessary to try to do everything they can. Remember last week, Romans 12, 18, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with those around you. I think, I think God blesses that, if that makes sense. I, I think... He honors peacemakers. He honors people who are trying to bridge a gap. Uh, go ahead, Kathy. Well, I was just going to say, 
just thinking about sincerity. I mean, it, you don't want to you don't want to say things that you right. don't mean yeah. just to be nice. Right. So you have to make sure it's coming from the right place. Yeah, you you, you you're right. Sincerity does matter very much. But you know what? There is a certain sense of sincerity to even do something trying to bridge the gap. You know what I mean? Yeah. You might not feel, you might still be hurt. You might feel, you know, you're, as you're doing it, you're, you're talking to the Lord and you're saying, Lord, I, this isn't me, but you know what? I, I want to do the right thing here and I want to do the godly thing here. I want to do what Jesus is asking us to do. So, yeah, but I, I mean, I agree. Since you want to be sincere, and at the same time, there's a psychological principle, and I can't tell you what the name of it is, but there's a psychological principle that is if you do something often enough, you come to believe it. Okay? And, and I think that's kind of what we're looking at here, that... Uh, and God's a great psychologist. He, he understands human dynamic and human behavior better than any of us. And uh, sometimes we just have to train ourselves. We have to train ourselves. I know when I'm, when I'm mentoring somebody or talking to somebody and they're struggling with certain things, you almost have to, it, it comes down to where you're teaching yourself how to rethink things, how to react to things differently. Uh, because... The, Doing the same thing over and over obviously hasn't worked. So, so you have to, but, but don't you have to train yourself with anything? You know, when the first time you, you pick up a cell phone, did you know how to use it? First time you tried a text message, did you know how to do it? You know, you had to teach yourself and train yourself. And, and you have to do that in how you see people, how you respond to people. Part of that stepping out of the comfort zone that you very much often talk about. Very much. And, I, and I've shared with you before, and I, boy, I'm, I, I fail at it as much as I'm succeeding at it right now. But when I'm just like passing people or dealing with folks that I don't know at all, and and I don't get the best reaction, you know, or they'll just walk by me, and I'm, I'm trying to be nice and courteous and. And I just want to lash out immediately. It's just that human nature. And, uh, but, but God has so clearly been showing me, son, you need to pray for that person. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying here, right? And it's like he always is, he's always whispering in my ear, if you don't pray for this person, who's going to? You might be the only person that's lifting this person up. And that's really got my heart right now. And I've watched myself, I, I get disappointed in myself quite often in, in my initial reactions to things, you know. Uh, but the good news is, is you can confess it and say, okay, Lord, get me back on track. What, what, what am I doing here? Pray for the person. Okay. Sometimes I wish we had a, like a, a one-minute delay or something. Re <laughs> rewind. Give me time to take it back and then jerk me back. That's right. That's right. So you don't get the whole count to ten, right? That's where that comes yeah, from. Yeah. Let's have a little bit of space here and have a chance to, to think about what we're saying. So, so if we're honest, if we're lifted to the Lord, we're talking about loving, loving our enemies, love those that we don't like, being honest about it, asking God to help us because we need it. He changes our perspective. He's showing us the good in the other person that we can build on. Uh, specific need they have, offering kind words whenever we possibly can, and then to pray for them. So, so what's Jesus have to say about people we don't like? Love them, pray for them. All right, how do you pray for them? How do you how do you pray for that person that just makes you want to spit nails? Help them not to be so stupid. <laughs> 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 well, um, we pray for real change, don't we? I think we have to pray for our attitude towards that. Person. There you go, Julie. <laughs> have we have we do, and that's kind of where we're starting off, isn't it? Right. 
God, I, it's not in me, right? I, I need help. And as we're, but we are praying for real change. We're, we're praying that that they that the light comes on for them, that they see what they're doing, that they see how they're treating people is hurting them, and and that that they see the truth of Christ, that they see their need for Christ. I mean, we're praying for them. You know, I, I, there's 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 people I'm praying they come to repentance. You know, that that they come to to see. What, what what they need to do. Of course, that's not Many times it's not them, it's, it's you. Yeah. I'm trying to say it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> many times. Which which goes back to confessing our hardness of heart, our poor attitudes, and asking God to change us. It's a, it's a it's it, the dynamic we're praying for is that God changes them as he's changing us. Okay? Can you imagine if world leaders did this? <laughs> yeah. But that's why we need to pray for world leaders, right? We're praying that light comes on for all of those who make important decisions and impact the lives of others. Um, you know, we, we're praying they'd be open to God and, and his movement in their lives, praying for our relationship with them. Um, Wonderful things happen as we pray for those we don't like because God deals with us. He won't let us go undealt with. If we're lifting up in earnestness, he softens our heart, he gives us patience, he gives us insight, and he gives us even compassion as we go along. Okay? This is a, a good little book I recommend if you're good. It, um, you know, what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks is coming from coming from the Sermon on the Mount, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he wrote this um, pr prior to, to things really had not exploded yet in Germany at this, at this point, but he could see it coming. And, 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 and this, on, this, on this particular point, passage of scripture where he talks about love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. He quotes um, a man that I'm not familiar with whatsoever. He, he quotes A.F.C. Vilmar, but his quote is speaking his heart. It, it, it's where Bonhoeffer is. And by the way, if you've never read his biography, I highly, highly recommend it. It's an incredible, just an incredible man of God who um, who lived out, you know, what we're looking at right here. So if, as you hear these words, I want to read what he says, and as you hear these words, keep in mind the context in which he's quoting this man. The context is he sees what's coming, and he sees how the nation has come behind Hitler, and he sees what's happening. He says, this commandment, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, um, that, that we should love our enemies and forego revenge will grow even more urgent in the holy struggle which lies before us. The time is coming when the confession of the living God will incur not only the hatred and the fury of the world, for on the whole it has come to that already, but complete ostracism from human society, as they call it. The Christians will be hounded from place to place subjected to physical assault, maltreatment, and death of every kind. Again, this is Bonhoeffer seeing what's coming in, in Germany. Our adversaries seek to root out the Christian church and the Christian faith because they cannot live side by side with us, because they see in every word we utter and every deed we do, even when they're not specifically directed against them, a condemnation of their own words and deeds. We do not reciprocate their hatred and contention. Although they would like it better if we did and so sink to their level. And how's the battle to be fought? We pray. We pray the prayer of earnest love for those very sons of perdition who stand around and gaze at us 
with eyes aflame with hatred and who have perhaps already raised their hands to kill us. It will be a prayer for the peace of these erring, devastated, and bewildered souls. A prayer for the same love and peace which we ourselves enjoy. A prayer which will penetrate to the depths of their souls and rend their hearts more grievously than anything they can do to us. Those are, I know to hear that might be tough, but those are powerful words that speak to everything we've been talking about last week and this week. And then I think about Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. I mean, he's living this out. He's praying for his enemies from the cross. He's not asking us to do something that he's not done. And he's not asking us to do something that he's not willing to empower us to do. The thing that Bonhoeffer speaks of over and over is that ultimately, in one-on-one -on -one relationships, what Jesus is asking us to do is ultimately the description of meekness, not weakness, meekness. It takes a lot. It, it, it takes more than we are. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit in us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. I think about, if you've ever looked at Voice of the Martyrs, some of the testimonies you get there. We're talking about people who literally lose everything for their faith and their prayers for the people who are hurting them. I think of John 13, verse 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another. And my question would be, is that command just for those who are nice to us. I mean, obviously not, right? As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Did, did my battery, you all hear me? Over the, okay. Let's, let's real quickly look at one more passage of Scripture. Let's go to Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. So Jesus has a lot to say about people we don't like, right? All right, Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. <clears throat> the, the clear admonition to stop judging and deal with your own shortcomings. Okay. Um, isn't it easy, I mean, it's so easy to criticize and judge those we don't like. They're easy targets, man. We can make a big old list and just keep it happening. We can, and just spread the word about, about what awful people they are and what they've done to us. I think there's something interesting when, when Jesus says the standards we use to judge others are going to be the very standards by which we are judged. And the only standards that you and I, the only standards we're to hold ourselves up to, and it's the highest standard imaginable, is the Word of God, the teachings of Christ. Mm -hmm. You mentioned spreading the word, and, and in addition to to the, to the feelings that we have against the people we don't like. I mean, that, that even exacerbates the problem. Yes, it does. It, it, it's so awful when somebody starts telling you how, how bad somebody else is. I mean, 
it's one thing to feel that way, and then now you're trying to get everybody else on board too. And they're not there to right they're, to defend themselves and tell the other side of the story, yeah. right? Um, yes, that's that is that's how church splits happen. That's how that's how families are separated. That's how friendships come to an end. Uh, you remember the first thing we we read. If something happens between you and another person, go quickly. Go quickly. Even if it means you get up out of worship and go, go make it right. Uh, but too often, in, in churches, among Christian people, too often we don't go to the person. We go to everybody else. You know what so-and-so did to me? And, 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 and people want to believe that stuff. I mean, there's something about us that we want to believe the bad about other people. Maybe it makes us feel better about ourselves. I don't know. But we eat up gossip. And, um, you know, and, and you know what the sad reality is most of the time? Let's say somebody makes me mad. Let's say Kay makes me mad. And I go to about 15 of my friends and tell them everything Kay just did to me. Well, there's not a thing Kay can do about it. There's not a daggone thing. She can go try to explain herself to 15 different people, but and then it just becomes one person's word against another, and people just decide who they're going to believe, and, and problems just really develop out of that. Or they think that... They think that, you did it. That, 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 you know, that if... That it's just, maybe I think that it's just you and I that have the problem, and now yes. we have fifteen now, other people that I don't know are mad at me. Too. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that is a that's a major problem in the Christian community, a major problem. Um, and and when we're the ones. Remember what in John thirteen thirty four and thirty five, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. That's how they're going to know. You wonder why the world's in such confusion about Jesus and about the church. Um, by the way, this idea of do not judge, that, that, that has nothing to do with uh, if somebody's offended, you go to them. That, that's, that's biblical. Matthew 18, Jesus said, if somebody offends, you go to that person. Well, and we looked at Last week, if if you have something against your brother, go to that person. Um, now, the plank in the eye, if you're going to go to that person who offended you, you better come clean before God before you go. You better make things right with God before you go. Because to be able to go to somebody... You need, you need to be walking in the Spirit to do that. What I found or observed is that an awful lot of Christian people cannot handle somebody coming to them and confronting them. They get mad. And then they slice you off <laughs> and say, well, that's how you feel about everything. When your desire is to Try to make things right. Okay, that's that's hard, and it is hard, right? Somebody comes to you, you know, and unless you believe in yourself, man, I can screw up, and I can. I've done it intentionally and unintentionally. So there's something really important here. We'll, we'll maybe kind of wrap it with this: this plank in your own eye. Every single one of us, your pastor included, has blind spots. You know what I mean by blind spots? Things that, that aggravate people. Things that we don't see in ourselves that drive other people crazy. Might be attitudes, might be the way we deal with things, might be words that we say, might be actions, whatever. Our blind spots are often there because we're not asking God to show us what we need to change within ourselves, within our walk with God, and within our, within our relationship with others. It kind of goes back again to what Mary was saying. We want other people to change, but we're not willing to change ourselves. And 
and one of the you know major pieces about being able to love our enemies is to be pliable and moldable ourselves, right? We're to be the clay in the potter's hands that he can mold us and shape us. The bad thing about blind spots is you don't know you have them. Now, friends, that's where I need your help. That's where we need each other's help. We need to be able to come to each other in Christian love and be able to say, let's talk about something. <laughs> yeah. How many of us are ready for that? But I don't want to talk about it. I don't want you to say, I'm sorry, I did it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> See, we have to be open to it, don't we? We have to be open. And, and you know... Seriously, I might do something, and I might do it repeatedly, and you guys see it as the church family, and it just, it, it's aggravating, and it does something to other people, and I'm totally, totally oblivious to it, and I need you. I need you to come to me, and, and if, if, you know, I just need you to talk to me and say, I love you. I have, I mean, I, this is not against you. I'm just, I just feel like I need to talk to you about something that I see. And you know what? I can promise you something. I will not be offended by that. I might not like what you say, but I know you're coming to me because you love me. And I think I know enough to know you're coming to me because you're seeing something that I'm not aware of that I need to be aware of. Now, how many of us are open to that? That's, that's not easy. That's not easy. But think of how the body of Christ would, would move forward if we were able to do that with each other. You're not, I, I would, it's not judging me. It's you're seeing something in me that's bringing pain to others' lives or is creating a problem that needs to be talked about so that I can do what I need to do more effectively. So that, and that goes for you too, if, if there's something that we're looking and saying, I don't think he or she's aware of that. Or there again, we just grumble about it and tell 15 other people. And they're all... Grumbling and telling other people is playing right into the enemy's hands. You're right. You're right. Why do you think we have so many, I mean, I, I, so many, uh, I, I love it. I, sometimes I want to say to people, why don't you start your own church? <laughs> just start your own daggone church and find <laughs> out. Where, yeah. Find out. Let's, let's see how well it goes. Let's, you've got it down perfect, so let's yeah. see how many people are willing to accept that. Okay? Yeah. It's happened time and time again. <laughs> okay? <laughs> there are very good reasons to start church plants. Then there are very bad reasons. And a bad reason is when you're splitting off because you're mad. That's a bad reason. Yeah. It's not going to probably work very well. Okay? I remember my mother-in-law saying, if you leave a church and go somewhere else, you're not going to find any different. Yeah, you're going to find the same people, yeah. same problems. Yeah. You know, same problems. Hey, going what's wrong with these people? They're just like, <laughs> <laughs> why can't anybody get this right? <laughs> yeah, she just said you're going there. You're going to have the same problems. Um, so let me just very quickly review because we need to stop. What does Jesus have to say about people we don't like? Number one, deal with your anger. Make things right with the other person. Number two, don't strike back. Stop the downward spiral. Be the bridge builder. Number three, love your enemies and pray for them. Number four, stop judging others. Deal with your own shortcomings. And as I look at that and I think about that, I just want to end with this thought. The Christian lifestyle is a radical lifestyle. It's a radical lifestyle. It's like no other way to live in this world. That's how we are to be different. And we won't stand out. I'll be honest with you. 
when I was in high school and college, that was what I always thought about Jesus. What a radical. What a radical. About how he lived and how he did things and what he taught. I wasn't here last week, and the first thing that came to my mind, and I think most of us in here do not have to do this because we're no longer in the workforce. My son told me that he had to take a test. How do you treat the person you don't like or the person that's different on the workforce? It's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he said, if you failed it, you had to take it till you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. How about that? That's a fascinating. I'd love to get my hands on that test. If he's got any pull. I'd love he to said see. he felt sorry for his boss because his boss was apparently a strict Christian that calls himself a Christian but doesn't accept the person who's different. Yeah. We've got a long ways to go, don't we? <laughs> okay. We, 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 need, we need to close in prayer because it's choir time. Father, we thank you so very much for our time tonight. I think every one of us, whether we're right here or at home, every one of us would confess this might be the toughest one yet. And we all need your help. So God, teach us about ourselves. Show us our blind spots. Help us to love one another. Uh, whether it's naturally there within us or we're allowing you to love others through us, even those we don't like, even our enemies. So go with us from this place and uh, we ask for your wisdom. We ask for your perspective and God, we pray for those relationships that, that aren't where you want them to be, that we can do everything we can, everything your son teaches us to do under your power to make it right. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.